Jan. Jan, barely a man, grew up in a small village right on the coast. Being the oldest of his siblings and the new generation of the village, a lot lay on his shoulders. Jan lived with his three younger siblings and his mother, the best seamstress in the village. Jan's mother worked hard for her family, sewing the village's finest clothes, bedding, bags and curtains while keeping an eye on the children. Jan's father was the village houndmaster. He bred and trained sheepdogs for the village farmers, Great Danes for the village guards, and bloodhounds for the village hunters. Jan's father was a very talented houndmaster, supplying trained dogs to many nearby villages and towns. Jan's father even trained wolves for the most skilled of hunters. A wild animal could hunt with natural instinct better than any trained domesticated breed, and with Jan's father's training, the wolves were unmatched. Jan's father, however, was not free of flaws. To remain calm around the wolves, Jan's father drank. Through the day and night, around his hounds and wolves alike, Jan's father drank to ensure his authority was calm and unquestionable. But one night, as Jan's father was training the hounds and wolves, the years of drinking caught up with him, and while opening the gate to the grounds, Jan's father suffered a cardiac arrest and fell to the ground. The hounds and wolves, seeing their master fall in pain, became frantic. Howling quickly turned to biting and scratching, and soon the beasts were free from their cages. Amassing around Jan's father in a panic, they dragged him by the shirt collar into the surrounding forest and fled into the night. The following morning, Jan's mother headed to the training grounds to check on Jan's father. He had often spent nights with the hounds, but never this late. Rushing as not to leave Jan and his siblings alone for too long, Jan's mother came upon the remnants of the previous night's scene. Jan's mother found paw prints going from the training ground out to the forest, alongside them tracings of something dragged through the mud and grass. Some hounds weaker than the others could not escape their cages and were left behind. After a short period of grieving, Jan's mother acted swiftly in the following months, selling the leftover hounds and training grounds as quickly as possible to buy a new loom. Jan's mother had always sewed, but never to support the family on her own. Jan grew up with his mother and siblings, barely remembering his father. Now on the verge of manhood, Jan found himself the oldest of the younger generation in the village. His elders were skilled and wise, but Jan was fit and strong, and often found himself doing work that others could not. In the village, the daughters often took the work of their mothers and the sons the work of their fathers. However, with the hounds gone, the ground given away and Jan's father unable to pass on his knowledge, Jan was on his own. Being one of the fittest in the village, Jan often helped the farmers with their crops, hauling bags of potatoes and wheat to and fro from sunrise to sunset. While moving these bags, Jan would notice that the finer bags that were easier on his hands were the work of his mother. When he was feeling disheartened, he would inspect and appreciate the seams of the bags he hauled. Being one of the strongest in the village, Jan often helped the carpenters and masons with their wood and stonework. They would work on maintaining and repairing the houses in the village and guide Jan to help them getting him to transport the wood and stone when they were too tired. Being one of the biggest in the village, Jan often helped the blacksmith. Usually, Jan would carry the iron and steel to the forge and the finished tools and hardware away. But the blacksmith had recently injured his shoulder and could not swing his hammer. Instead, Jan now took his place, swinging the hammer as the blacksmith critiqued and guided each strike. Jan often found himself moving goods around the village in the bags that his mother would sew. Jan did as much as he could for his mother and siblings, but often felt that the work he did was the work of his father's hounds. They used to be seen pulling carts all around the village with food, wood or stone, allowing the village people to focus on their work. Jan often felt encouraged to support his mother and siblings, but discouraged by the legacy of his father. After a handful of years helping around the village, Jan grew past the resentments he held for his father. Happy with his work, he got closer to the village farmer, carpenter and mason, and found his place in the village as the oldest of the younger generation. Little occurred in Jan's village in the years after his father's death. The villagers tended to their crops, maintained their houses, and lived their lives, until they did not. On a rainy winter night, the village hunter was skirting the edge of the village with his wolf, one of the last wolves trained by Jan's father. As the hunter approached the village farmland where the livestock and crops were kept, the hunter's wolf became alert and still, looking into the nearby tree line. The hunter followed suit, keeping low and still near the wolf. In a second, a cloud of black, dark figures erupted from the tree line in complete silence. 
the formless black entity split in two. One half headed straight for the fence of the farmland, while the other to a distant moving light source, a guarding farmer. As the first group swiftly leapt over the fence, the second swarmed the light source. The silhouette of the lone farmer was suddenly accompanied by many others, and they began to dance violently like shadow puppets, until the light source was dropped and extinguished on the ground. Now blind, the hunter waited with his wolf until sunrise to inspect the scene. As the sun rose, so did the villagers. A crowd gathered around the farmland with the hunter at the helm. A pack of beasts had killed one of the village farmers and a number of cattle. However, none of the victims were mauled. There were no screams and there were no howls. These beasts chose a target, stalked them in total silence, quickly executed them with aimed attacks to the throat, fed and dispatched into the night. These beasts are trained, said the hunter. They are the escaped hounds and wolves of the hound master, and they will return. The crowd of villagers stood in silence looking upon the massacre, each individual occasionally glancing in Yan's direction. Losing any amount of cattle was detrimental to the village, not to mention the loss of the village farmer. The village could not risk the beasts returning. They must be killed. The days following the attack, the village guard were on high alert, ensuring all villagers were safe inside besides the hunter. Inspecting the carcasses and footprints, the hunter calculated that the pack was at least 20 large, a pack size impossible by the average wolf social structure. The hunter then tracked the paw prints from the farmland and plotted their direction across the forest, grassland, moor and bog until the highlands, where the only cave large enough for a pack that size could be. With the loss of a farmer and a number of cattle, the village was in disarray attempting to cover the needs of the people. Sacrificing even one pair of capable hands to hunt the pack could prove more than tragic for the village as a whole if it were a failure. Yam was the only one in the village fit enough for the journey over the treacherous lands to the cave. Yan was also the strongest in the village, and therefore the most likely to succeed in taking on the pack alone. Not to mention the unfinished business left behind by Yan's father. Yan volunteered willingly for the hunt. Over these days, Yan prepared. He asked his mother to sew him hardy clothing and bagging for his journey, and travelled around the village to stock up. Yan visited the farmers. They gave him potatoes, bread and meat. These were the crops he had harvested and hauled previously, but it only meant he appreciated the food even more. After the farmers, Yan then visited the carpenter and mason. The carpenter gave Yan a cart, light and sturdy, and a lone sword handle perfectly formed to Yan's hand. Yan remembered the cart and the wood of the handle, but it only meant it felt comfortable and familiar. The mason apologised for not being of more use, but gave Yan a necklace with a stone totem of a wolf. Yan recognised the stone it came from, but it only meant he was stunned by its new beauty. After the carpenter and mason, Yan visited the blacksmith. The blacksmith gave him a hammer and an unfinished blade. Yan swinged the hammer in a mighty arc, forged a sword with a carpenter's handle and the blacksmith's blade. As Yan worked, the blacksmith inspected every swing, his face inches away from the impact of the hammer. The blacksmith winced with each swing, but did not flinch, and kept a close eye on the edge of the blade. Yan, with the finished sword, was tired from smithing, but it only meant he trusted in the blade. Yan headed home with his cart full of supplies, and as he rounded the last bend, he saw his siblings frantically filling a leather bottle from the well. As Yan approached, they quickly finished pouring the water, sealed the bottle and handed it to him. Yan and his siblings hugged and said goodbye. Just before any tears could form, Yan pulled away and headed inside. Yan's mother was sitting at the loom, finishing off a coat. Beside her was a new bag, shoes and set of clothes. Yan put on the new clothes and coat, and loaded his last remaining supplies into the bag which he then placed on the cart. Yan hugged his mother, said goodbye, and left. Moving quickly from his home and without looking back, Yan started on his journey. Going from his home to the farmland and then into the nearby tree line, he began to follow the map of the hunter. A small path led Yan through the forest. Yan followed this path for a couple of hours until he became aware of a presence nearby. The hunter and his wolf stepped out of the shadows and onto the path in front of Yan. May I walk with you? Yan, the hunter and the wolf walked for a number of hours together through the forest in silence. After some time, the hunter started talking to Yan. I knew your father well, said the hunter. 
A brilliant hound master. The only man I've ever known who could train a wild animal. The hunter gestured to the wolf by his side. And the only man I've ever known who could drink like a fish. Jan stayed quiet throughout the journey with the hunter, focusing on the path in front of him. Your father often felt like he was on his own, said the hunter. That he was isolated, not contributing to anything and not getting help from anywhere. But he forgot that the food he fed the dogs came from the farmers. The cages he put them in were made by the carpenter, and I captured the wild wolves he trained. Jan scowled at the hunter. He also forgot about what his dogs did. Your father's dogs were sold far and wide, to brilliantly skilled men. The dogs did amazing work, and that allowed their owners to do even more amazing things. Jan's girl faded. You're young. Don't be so harsh on yourself, like your father was. The hunter stopped, followed by the others. The hunter looked down at the wolf, and then gestured towards Jan, then turned away and started walking back towards the village, while the wolf stayed by Jan's side. Jan, confused, shooed the wolf away, but the wolf did not flinch. Jan looked back to question the hunter, but he had already disappeared into the forest. Still confused, Jan continued on his journey and found the wolf following each of his steps closely through the forest. After a number of hours, Jan was on the other side of the forest and in the hillside scattered grasslands. Following the hunter's map, Jan was taken through hills and valleys. Surprisingly, the cart travelled with ease up and down the terrain. The carpenter must have worked countless hours on the cart to ensure it was light, and worked even longer on the wheels to let them turn so freely. Jan had never noticed the expert craftsmanship before, just hauling the cart around the village. On the other side of the grasslands, Jan came upon the moor, vast open lands as far as the eye could see. While walking through the moor, Jan became restless. Tired of the repeating landscape, he found his eyes wandering until they rested upon his sleeve. A sleeve crafted from a beautiful silk, Thin as not to let Jan overheat, but long enough to make sure he was protected from the cutting winds on the open land. The stitching of the sleeve was almost seamless, crafted with an expert hand and eye. Jan stared at his clothes for hours, thinking about his mother until he was on the far side of the moor. After the moor, Jan came upon the bog between him and the highlands, a treacherous, untraversable and impenetrable terrain. Jan, leaving behind the cart and excess supplies, packed the bare essentials into his bag and headed onwards. He made sure to save the farmer's bread and meat and his siblings' water for later in his journey. They proved to be dense and hearty essentials that were easy to carry. During Jan's short breaks from his travels, he sat on the ground and thought of his time in the village. The work he did, the people he helped, and those around him. There would be no food for Jan to move had the farmers not grown it. There'd be no houses to maintain had the carpenter and mason not built them. There'd be no tools to make the houses had the blacksmith not forged them, and all of them would have frozen to death long ago had Jan's mother not made their clothes. Jan looked at the wolf who had been following him since the hunter left. This wolf would not be here if not for my father, said Jan. I would not be here if not for my father. The wolf then would not exist if not for my father. The cattle would not be dead if not for my father. The farmer would not be dead if not for my father. My mother would not have to work tirelessly, if not for my father. I would not be alone, if not for my father. Jan's questioning turned to frustration, and frustration to anger. He stood up from the floor and paced in circles, spiralling into hateful madness, until the wolf approached Jan and sat in front of him, blocking his path. Jan noticed he was pacing in the direction back the way he came, back towards the cart on the edge of the bog. Jan looked down at the wolf, and remembered the gift from the mason. Jan took the necklace off and held it in his hand. The totem was made of rock and sculpted into the head of a wolf. While detailed, the totem seemed to depict a specific wolf, not dissimilar to the one at Jan's feet. Jan remembered the great rock he had delivered to the mason months before. He remembered how he noticed the size of the rock getting smaller and smaller each week he saw the mason. Jan remembered walking in on the mason while he was sculpting that rock. The mason would sit and stare at the rock for hours, deliberating and deciding on what to do. Jan remembered the mason making mistakes, correcting them, and even having to scrap what he was sculpting in its entirety. Jan remembered what the rock could have been. A fireplace, a gravestone, a stone brick. But instead, it became the totem of a wolf in Jan's hand. The mason had been stuck many times with the rock. He had to start again and fix mistakes he had made. But at the end of it all, the mason had made the totem by persisting, even when it seemed pointless. 
the totem may be a product of the mistakes of the mason, but it didn't mean the totem was defined by them, and it didn't make the totem any less beautiful. Jan realised he wasn't going to the mountain to fix the mistakes of his father and return to life as it was before the pack. It would be impossible. Jan was going to the mountain to keep chiselling and to forge something new. With the totem in hand, Jan gained a new motivation to traverse the bog and continue his journey alongside the wolf. Jan came upon the highlands, a mountainous and equally treacherous region. Few from Jan's village had ever ventured this far. Just before sunrise, Jan set off up the mountain towards the cave marked by the hunter. Jan's first steps on the mountain were tentative and hesitant, slowing Jan's progress. As Jan slowly ascended the mountain, he noticed that the cold did not affect him. The coat Jan's mother made had a thick layer of wool and leather. This must have been from the farmers. As Jan was inspecting his outfit, he got distracted and started walking quicker and with more confidence. But Jan did not slip. The shoes that his mother had made were also of great quality, allowing Jan to walk at speed without consequence. So, Jan stormed up the mountain, and as he grew closer to the cave, Jan's steps grew in purpose, propelling him further. The wolf, still by Jan's side, seemed to pick up on Jan's newfound purpose and reacted with equal direction, leaping up the mountain in great bounds. As Jan and the wolf approached the cave, Jan became consumed by drive and vision. Brandishing the sword he had forged, Jan marched right up to the mouth of the cave and stood in place, with the wolf following suit by his side. As Jan stood in the entrance of the cave, his eyes scanned within. There were paw prints leading in and out of the entrance into the side of the cave where a circle of prints formed around a skeleton. The skeleton was wearing a silk set of clothes, masterfully crafted and almost seamless. Jan recognised the work immediately and realised this was his father in the clothing sewn by his mother. Jan's father was propped up on the side of the cave entrance, his clothes in pristine condition and a handful of food scraps neatly scattered around him. In an instant, Jan's hatred of the wolves and resentment for his father washed away and was replaced with a kind of tranquillity. Jan couldn't help but smile and laugh a little to himself. Jan had found his father, and he was still the leader of the pack. With Jan's spirits high, he forgot where he was. His laugh echoed through the cave and woke the beasts within. Almost instantaneously, the pack of wolves and hounds appeared from the shadows and rushed to the cave entrance, cutting off Jan from getting any deeper into the cave. But Jan barely noticed. He was still looking at his father with a warm smile. The hounds and wolves began to get closer to Jan, snarling, barking and biting at the air, but Jan gave no notice. The hunter's wolf by Jan's side followed his example, giving no attention to the frantic pack either. After a beat, Jan put away his swords and approached the body of his father. And as he did, the pack members surrounding their leader simply moved out of the way. Still showing hostility, the beast remained cautious of Jan and the wolf, but decided to hold the theatrical acts of aggression. Jan kneeled next to his father and looked closer at the stitching, perfect as always. Jan then took the mason's totem off and placed it around his father's neck. Still giving no notice to the pack gathered around him, Jan carefully moved his father from the side of the cave, laid him down, took off his own coat and covered his father. Goodbye, Dad. Jan stood up from his father's body and turned around to face the pack. The hunter's wolf had stayed at the mouth of the cave and watched the other hounds and wolves who had now grouped together on the other side. Jan approached the pack and stopped two steps away from them, he then took his last pieces of meat from his bag, dropped them, and then gestured to the hunter's wolf who promptly came to his side and began to eat. The pack, initially tentative, followed suit and gathered at the feet of Jan as well. And as Jan stood there in the cave amongst bloody meat, the resting body of his father, and the remnants of his legacy, the sun rose. From the summit of the mountain where the cave sat, Jan could see all the way down to the base of the highland mountain, across the bog where he left his cart, along the open moors, up and down each hill and valley in the grasslands, over the forest, into the village and way out into the open sea until the horizon and the rising sun. Jan had never seen such a sight before, and he was sure no one in the village would have either. As Jan stood and stared, the pack finished their meals and slowly gathered together in front of him. No longer the beast they were before, the pack had sensed a new leader, as strong, calm and unquestionable as their last, but different. Jan shut his eyes and listened. He heard the quiet breath of the pack around him, the occasional shuffle of rock under paw, the hum of life down the mountain, and the wind working its way up and into the cave. As the sun rose, Jan felt its warmth on his face. Without his coat, he was almost freezing, but had barely noticed until he felt the sun. 
He hadn't then remembered. He remembered when he was a child. He remembered his mother, siblings and the old loon. He remembered his father as he was. He remembered the training grounds in the pack. He remembered the forgotten days and his father's face and his smile and the way he used to talk or not talk. And then Jan understood. Jan understood he wasn't too dissimilar from his father and he was overjoyed. Jan realised that it didn't matter. He wasn't defined by his past. He could appreciate the present and make a future he was proud of. Jan no longer resented his reality and appreciated his opportunity. Jan soon returned to the village with every single hound and wolf that had gone missing the day of his father's death. The farmers bared some food to feed them, and the carpenter got to work making a new set of enclosures. Jan had come to terms with the faults of his father, and was able to appreciate what he had done for him. Jan could now take the past torch to patch the shadows to cast silhouettes of his own.